Welcome everybody to Prostate Cancer UK's um, Ideas to Impact webinar. Uh, so this is this is a webinar, this is an opportunity for us to tell you a little bit about some of the research that we're funding um, and, and with a bit of a focus on research in Northern Ireland and research in Birmingham. Um, and to hopefully give you an idea of the difference we can make with research and, and why it's so important that we fund it um, and, and how that can help men with prostate cancer now and in the future. Um, so I'm Matthew Hobbs, I'm the Director of Research at Prostate Cancer UK, so I get the really nice job of working out what research we should fund, working with the researchers that we do fund to, to help them, well, to give them the money to do it, um, and then to make sure that, that we support them to actually deliver those results that are gonna make a difference for men. Um, I'm also your host today, but you'll be glad to know that you won't be hearing a huge amount from me because we've got a great panel of, of three people who uh, have got really interesting and exciting things to tell you about from their own personal experience, prostate cancer, or about their research. Um, so I will mainly be asking them questions, either questions that I've got for them to get a bit of an introduction for, for everybody to understand what they're, what they're doing and what they're all about. And then at the end, we've got about half an hour, we'll be asking those panellists the questions that, that are submitted from, from all of you. Um, so I've got some housekeeping things to do first. Uh, the webinar is being recorded so that um, the people who registered but couldn't attend tonight will, will get a recording of that. Um, but you won't be visible on that recording, so, so you don't need to worry about having cameras on or off or, or anything like that. I also can't see you, um, so you, I know you're there because I can see the number, um, but all as I can see at the minute is a massive version of my own face, so not very pleasant for me, but just so you're aware of what it looks like for us. Um, in terms of answer, asking your questions, hopefully everybody um, who's joined us will be able to see a, a little button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. If you click into that, you can type your question um, a, a couple of members of the team are going to gather all those questions together and send them over to me so that I can so that I can ask as many as possible um, when we get to that Q and A session at the end. Um, what I would say is please don't share any um, specific health information in those Q and A um, sessions. There's, there's a number of people in the background who will be seeing those those questions. We also can't answer any any very specific um, questions about your own personal clinical situation. Um, not least because none of the panelists are actually medical doctors, we're all scientists. Um, if you do have particular concerns or particular questions about your own treatment or your own prostate cancer journey, um, what I would say is that the, the, the best place to ask those is our specialist nurse service. So Prostate Cancer UK has a, a service which is, um, which is run by specialist cancer nurses uh, and they will spend as much time as, as you need them to on the phone or by email or by WhatsApp. Uh, answering those specific questions. So if you do have those those very particular questions about your own treatments or or, or, or diagnosis, um, the best place to take them is to the to our specialist nurse um, service. And, and one of the team will, will put some details about how to contact those nurses in the chat so that you can see all of that. Um, so what are we going to be talking about today? So, so basically I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Prostate Cancer UK's research strategy. So what, what we fund and why we fund that stuff. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about how we know that's working, so the impact of our research to date. Um, but really, I'm then going to hand over to, to, to hear from our panellists. And so we've got three great panellists. Um, we've got um, Alfred Fagan, who's a, a man with prostate cancer. He's going to talk, talk to us a little bit about his own diagnosis and, and how that's happened. And then we're going to talk a little bit about prostate cancer in black men and, and the research that's happening around that at the minute. Um, we've got um, Professor Paula Mendes from the University of Birmingham, who's going to talk about her research looking at how to improve early diagnosis. And we've got Professor John Callan from Ulster University. And John's going to talk to us about the, the research he's leading to try and develop new treatments that are more effective and, and come with less side effects. Uh, and then, as I say, at the end, we've got about half an hour where we'll be spending time just talking about uh, well anything you want to talk about, really. So whatever questions come in, we'll, we'll ask the panellists and... Uh, and hopefully have a good debate and a good a, a good chat. Um, I, yeah, I, on the questions, don't please don't wait until the end. Please feel free to submit them as we go, so that you remember and and, and we'll as I say we'll gather them all up at the end and, and start asking those questions. I think that's all of the housekeeping stuff I have to do. We're virtual, so you all know where your own toilets are, uh, hopefully. Um, and so with that, I'll start with the main thing. So so as I say, I'm going to start a little bit by talking about Prostate Cancer UK's research strategy. So just to give you an idea of, of the research we fund. So the, the main thing to know about Prostate Cancer UK's research strategy is that it is a very broad strategy. So we fund research that improves or that aims to improve diagnosis of prostate cancer, 
We fund research that aims to improve treatment of localised prostate cancer, and we fund research that aims to improve treatment of advanced, so metastatic prostate cancer that's spread outside the prostate. Um, now that sounds like a lot of stuff, and it is a lot of stuff, and, and sometimes we're challenged about why we don't just focus on one particular question or one particular scientific area. Um, and the reason is that prostate cancer is a very, very complex disease. Um, there are a huge number of things we don't yet know about it. There are a huge number of things that we're starting to learn, but as we learn those things, it becomes obvious that it's very, very complex and even more complex than we thought it was in the past. Um, and so really to make the progress that we want to see and that men really need, we need to make sure that we're funding research that answers all, all as many of those questions as possible. Um, and, and there is some precedent here, so we can look at other cancers that are a bit ahead of prostate cancer in terms of reducing the number of people who die from them, in terms of investing in research. Breast cancer is a really good example here. So the number of women dying from breast cancer has been coming down since the, since, since the 1980s at least. And if you look back at the research that was funded that led to that reduction in death from breast, breast cancer, um, you can see that it wasn't just research in one particular area, it was a combination of progress across diagnosis, treating early disease and treating late disease. And all of those things combined eventually have, have delivered that sustained reduction in death from cancer. And that's exactly what we're trying to do in prostate cancer. So that's, that's why our strategy is, is broad in that sense. The other thing about our strategy is that we fund research right through from the initial idea. So the very first discovery, the very first time a researcher thinks, well, that's something interesting that we should think about. Right through all the different stages of research that happen in university labs, into clinical trials and so we'll also fund clinical trials so we fund the whole sort of spectrum of, of different research and that's one of the reasons that that we call this webinar ideas to impact the research is a bit of a, a journey and hopefully you'll hear from our panelists what what particular stage they're working on and, and what comes next and what's gone before and the other thing to say about our research strategy is that, that we fund research right across the uk and so as i say we've got um we've got a bit of a focus today on the midlands and, and on northern ireland um, but we do we do fund research right across the uk so so when we open research funding competitions we we ask researchers across all universities and all hospitals in the uk are eligible to apply and so we get applications from from everywhere pretty much and then the way we decide what to fund is not by where it's come from or or even really what area of science it's in but we we fund the, the highest quality research basically we, we we go through a very robust process where we bring expert reviewers so we, we we engage experts from around the world actually not just the uk who we ask to tell us how good a piece of research is whether it's needed whether it's one of the best that they've seen in in, in this funding competition and then we fund the ones that are best so so the ones that those experts those independent experts tell us are the best and they've got the best chance of making an impact for men are the ones that get funded so what that means in practice is we do have a portfolio of research we've got about 40 active projects at the minute uh, and they do span the entirety of the uk so so they they are happening in all of the different areas of the uk in universities and hospitals around the country um so that's a little bit about our strategy um and before i stop talking and, and hand over to or bring in our panelists. Um, I thought I'd just touch on, on the other bit of that. So that's kind of the ideas bit. So the research strategy is how we get the ideas from, from the researchers. But what about the impact bit? And so I'm really pleased to say that we, we know that we're doing good work. We know that we're funding good research because we've now got a, a whole list of, of pieces of research that we've funded that have now delivered impact. And so there is a bit of a time like between funding research and getting the, 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 the change in practice, if you like, the new treatment or the new way of diagnosing prostate cancer. But we've got a, a, a list now of, of examples where that's happened because of our research funding. Um, for some of those, we've worked them up into, into full case studies. I, I'm not, I don't want to spend too long talking to you because um, I do want, you, want, to, um, want you to hear from the panel. Um, but what I would say is that, that we've got around about nine of those, those impact case studies, if you like, that, are, that, we've, that we've put on the website and we've explained in full what we funded, so that how, what was the research and when we funded it and how that's now translated into a real impact for men with prostate cancer. And, and as you'd hope that those, those examples of impact, much like our strategy, span all of those really important questions in prostate cancer. So how do we diagnose better? 
We've got examples where we've improved the way prostate cancer is diagnosed because of the research we funded. How do we treat men with localized prostate cancer to make sure that we cure them when the when the cancer is treated when it's still in the prostate? We've got examples of treatments that are now used routinely because of research we funded. We've got a lot of examples of research that has improved treatment of men with advanced prostate cancer. So advanced prostate cancer is the prostate cancer that kills men. And that's that's really where we we need to see different treatments and new ways to treat coming in. And we've got some examples of that and, and ways to make that treatment at that stage more precise so that men live as long as possible with as good a quality of life as possible despite their prostate cancer. So hopefully um, you'll be able to see in the in the chat that there'll be a link to that research impact web page. And so if you want to know more about any of those impact case studies, um, it's a really great um, resource to see how research we funded is, is now making an impact um, on, on men in, in clinic and in real life. So really that's that's kind of my introduction. I, I, and so I'm, I'm now going to move over and, and introduce the first of our panel members. So, so one thing that is really important to know about prostate cancer before I do is that it is really, really common. Um, so one in eight men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their life in the UK. Um, anybody over the age of 50 is at increased risk and your risk increases as you get older from that point. But some men have an even higher risk than that and, and black men in particular have twice the risk of prostate cancer. So black men are twice as likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer as white men and twice as likely to die from prostate cancer as white men. And that's really important um, information because that, that allows us to target raising, awareness raising and to, to help help black men especially understand that actually their, their chance of being diagnosed and their chance of benefiting from going and talking to their doctor about prostate cancer um, is, is that much higher, it's twice as important, if you like. Um, and so I'm going to bring in the first of our panellists. So Alfred uh, Fagan is a man with prostate cancer. Um, Alfred, welcome. Hopefully you can hear Hello. me okay. I can. Um, Alfred, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your story? I'm Alfred. I'm from Birmingham. About 10 years ago when I was 50, watching a TV programme this morning on telly, I think there was a, a week where they was talking about prostate cancer. Samuel Jackson was on there. You had a few people talking about prostate cancer. So I happened to, was going to the doctors anyway, just because of a bad back, nothing to do with prostate cancer. And when I got there, he said, because of your age, you might as well have a test. So I had the PSA test. Then after that, they called me back in and says that my levels was high. But at the time, there was nothing wrong with me whatsoever. No symptoms, no nothing at all. I would have had no reason on a normal circumstances to even have that test. So I had that, then they said something, it's a bit I, then I had to go through a series of different tests. I had a biopsy and whatever, then they told me I had prostate cancer. But the main bit, there was nothing wrong with me. I wasn't getting up wean, I had no symptoms, I was fine. And plus I was only 50 at the time anyway. Yeah, so I mean, and so that's, that is a really important message, Alfred. So, so thank you. Um, it is that that fact that most men with localized prostate cancer, so so prostate cancer when it's localized is still in the prostate, and there are a lot of treatment options that are very successful for men with localized prostate cancer, but men with prostate cancer that's still localized tend not to have any symptoms. So you, you will hear this this idea that actually getting up to go for a weird night very often is a symptom of prostate cancer. Actually probably it's just a symptom of getting older and as you get older you're more likely to have prostate cancer so it's a bit coincidental what we know now is that a, a, the majority of men with localized prostate cancer which is the stage where we want to catch it don't have symptoms and so that that idea of understanding risk and understanding awareness it, is really important and so you said that your your gp proactively said to you you should have a bsa test is that right yeah because my gp what you'd say is a GP in Birmingham, in the in the city. He happened to be more aware of it, and he told me, "Oh, why don't you have the test?" At the time, I was terrified because I thought it was an internal examination. And when he said it was a blood test, I was having a blood test anyway for other things, so it's just an extra tick in the box. Yeah. So I done it. Yeah. So I mean that 
in a way that's i mean clearly nobody wants to be diagnosed with cancer but actually catching it early is the key thing here and it, that that sounds like best best in class of gp behavior to to recognize your increased risk to offer you a psa test and to explain what it was that's exactly what we're trying to get consistently all gps to do if you like yeah but not all of them do it because i can still go to that same gp tomorrow and i will not see one leaflet about prostate cancer i will about everything else smoking breast cancer but you will not see nothing about prostate cancer so i was lucky out of 10 doctors the one yeah. i saw that day was aware about it yeah and, it, and and that's exactly where i guess where we come in and actually where a lot of our supporters and volunteers come in in, in raising awareness of prostate cancer um and, and especially in black men or men at higher risk so so you a group of men at high risk of a member of the family history so so tell us a little bit then about your diagnosis alfred if you don't mind and, and how that went so i had the biopsy then it says um, i think i had to come back in about four weeks but i had a letter telling me to come back in two weeks so from there i was terrified anyway because your appointment was early then when i got there they told me that they found out of the 12 samples, I think they found cancer in three out of the 12. So basically, from there, I had prostate cancer. Then everything changed then for me. Yeah. So then so then you started talking about treatment options, presumably? Yeah. I had radical prostatectomy. I had mine removed. I had mine removed um, after about, might be, three, four months, really, I could say. I was okay. I was out and about. I wasn't able yeah. to go back to the gym, but on the outside, I was still moving around and getting back to normal. So mine's been 10 years now anyway, So, and I still have my test and everything's still low. So I still see I'm one of the lucky ones because I found it early. So my volunteering, what I do try and explain to all the men I meet, you've got to find it early. If you want to come out how I have, you need to find it don't wait for symptoms. So that's the way I try and explain to people, don't wait for the symptoms. Excellent. And, and just, uh, and, and thank you for doing that, Alfred, because actually that's a very selfless thing to do to help more men be lucky like you. What, how do you find the response to that message? Are, are men receptive to it? Are you, are you, you know, are you having those conversations easily? Are people listening, I suppose? Well, it's strange. When I was diagnosed, to me, nobody else I know had prostate cancer. But when I start speaking to people about it, now I'm a volunteer, I'm amazed at how many people I actually know who did have it or have had it since, because men don't speak about it, so they don't mention it. So I could be in a room with a group of men, some of them had it even four or five years ago, but it's a secret. Yeah. But because I'm a bit outspoken, then they start telling me, oh, I had this surge and I had this done. So I speak to a lot of them about it, but I do spend a lot of time telling men to have the test. There's too many people in my group now, my age, I know what's actually got it, had it, been diagnosed, and there's still more to come. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, so again, um, Serena in the chat has just shared a, a a link to Prostate Cancer UK's Risk Checker. So that that is a very quick, very simple tool online. It will ask you a couple of questions about your age, ethnicity, and family history. And then it, if you fill that in, it gives you some personalized information about your level of risk and what you need to know about prostate cancer. So I guess effectively, Alfred, it's it's the conversation you're having in person, but done online. I'm sure not, not as effective. Yeah, it is the conversation. Them. Yeah, yeah. yeah it um, would be good if there was more volunteers because people do respond to people directly speaking to them. You know what yeah. I mean? Even if they, they never thought about it or they wouldn't have gone to the risk checker because some of them, they don't, they've don't, they never even heard the word prostate cancer really until yeah. you mention it to them. And it does make a big difference having people like me speaking about it openly all the time. I completely agree. So, so a couple of things on that. One, we're always after more people to help us raise awareness. So if anybody does want to volunteer, please get in touch with the team. Um, and two, I think, I think you're exactly right, Alfred, that it's really important that men who have been diagnosed talk about it, you know, talk about it with their families, talk about it with their friends, because that, that is the most powerful way to raise that awareness. Um, 
So thanks, Alfred. We'll come back to you in the in the Q and A if that's all right. I'm I'm sure okay. people will be interested to find out more about about the way you were diagnosed and your treatments. Just to to think a little bit about about research and how that links to Alfred's story. So I, I mentioned that one of the things we do know about prostate cancer is that black men have got twice the risk of white men, um, and that is really important because we can tell black men that we can we can make GPs aware, as yours hopefully was Alfred that that it's more important even the normal to have a to have a conversation about prostate cancer but it's not enough and so where the research comes in is the the thing we don't understand is why black men have twice the risk and we really really need to understand that because if we could understand that we could start to try and find ways to diagnose those men so if we understand why men are at high risk we can find ways to diagnose their prostate cancer sooner but importantly if we understand what's raising men's risk we could translate that into a treatment potentially and so uh, one of the pieces of research that the Prostate Cancer UK is funding at the moment is called the Profile Study. So it's a clinical trial that is recruiting black men specifically, black men who haven't had prostate cancer, um, and following them up, test, taking blood samples and, and following them up, and then it's, it's recruiting 350 black men. A proportion of them will be diagnosed with prostate cancer, and from the blood samples that are taken, the researchers are going to look at the, the, the differences in their genes compared to the men who didn't get prostate cancer to see if they can pick apart that complicated biology, I guess, of what is what is increasing the, the risk in black men, what's causing that excess risk. Um, and so that's that's one piece of research that we've got ongoing now that is that is looking at that particular question. Um, I should I should probably say that that trial is still recruiting. So if people there's a, there's a bit on our website that somebody will put a link to. Uh, there's a link there in the chat. Um, so if anybody's interested to know more or potentially to get involved as a as a um, to be recruited into that trial, um, if you have a look at that that web page, it will tell you what what particular characteristics you need to have in order to to be involved in that trial. Um, but we're really really keen that 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 trial succeeds in recruiting enough black men because actually one of the things about prostate cancer is previous research hasn't hasn't done a good enough job at recruiting black men um, the you know the research community needs to do a better job but this is a trial that is specifically looking at black men to try and answer some of those questions we've not been able to answer before because of that so that's so so Alfred is our, our first panelist I guess and, and obviously a man with with a, a sort of personal experience of, of prostate cancer I'm going to move on slightly and, and so so I guess the important thing to to hear from from that bit is one of the really important things is that that men understand if they're at high risk of prostate cancer and when they're at high risk of prostate cancer because that that allows them to trigger that conversation with the GP to have a PSA blood test that ends up with diagnosis I'm going to move on now to our next panelist who, who is working on research um, to try and improve how we diagnose prostate cancer once men are there in that sort of situation where they, they know they're at high risk and they, they want to be tested for prostate cancer. Um, so just before I introduce Paula, we've got a, a bit of audience participation to make sure you're still all there and all listening. Um, so you should see a poll um, appear. There we go. So it's a, a, a little bit of I guess a fun question to see uh, if you can get this right. I'll give you, I'll be honest, I don't think I would have got this right if I'd been asked the question before seeing the answers uh, and I probably signed off this spend. So the question is how much funding have we awarded to the Midlands over the past five years? Um, and so if you want to tick one of those boxes, see the team's giving me some really nice detailed numbers to read out. I'm going to go for 430,000, 507,000 or 570,000 um, and we'll see if you get that right. I'm hoping that this poll will start telling me that people are answering it. Okay, I can't see any results. I can still see the poll. I may be looking in the wrong place. Um, but I can tell you that the right answer is £569,000. Uh, oh, okay, and about 40% about of you got that right. So, um, yeah, most most people got it. And most people went for 507,000, so you were almost there. Um, so that's that's the amount we've spent in, in the Midlands on research specifically over the past five years. Actually, since Prostate Cancer UK was founded and started funding research in 1969, uh, 1996, 
um, we've spent about 1.2 million pounds on research in the Midlands. Um, and so, so some of that some of that research funding has gone to our next panelist, and so I'm, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Paula Mendes. Um, hi, Paula. Um, Paula, do you want to introduce yourself and, and tell the audience a little bit about your research, and, and then I'll ask some questions about it as well. Of course. So I'm Paula Mendes, and uh, I come from uh, the School of Chemical Engineering and Healthcare uh, Technologies Institute at the University of Birmingham. And what we do, I'm a professor of advanced materials and nanotechnology, and what we do is to man manipulate materials at nanoscale, very, very small scale, work with molecules, and by doing so, we are able to detect molecules, biomarkers associated with prostate cancer, and what we develop as a group is uh, creating new diagnostic assays that will uh, more accurate uh, will uh, diagnose one of them we work with uh, with other cancers but in this case with aggressive prostate cancer that is what we'll be talking about today that's great so so thanks for that paula so um so you mentioned biomarkers there so just just for the audience so um just to explain that a, a biomarker is just anything in the body that tells us something basically so for example psa so the psa blood test that, that many of you will be aware of is the way we currently diagnose prostate cancer psa is a biomarker um and so, so Paula, just I guess the 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 heart of your research is to improve the way we diagnose prostate cancer, right? It's to it's to do a better job than the PSA blood test. So, can you tell us a little bit about why that's necessary? Yeah, so it's like Alfred said, the, the PSA test and and it's good in, in this case it detected the at the early stage the prostate cancer, but there are issues with the PSA test in the sense that this PSA that is a biomarker, the PSA is a glycoprotein, and I'm not going to detail, but it's a protein and then has sugars attached to it. And what we we do on the PSA test is having this, we are just looking at the protein side. And so if there is more than four nanograms per milliliter, the 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 men might have prostate cancer, but there's a, a lot of false positives as well. A lot of men go to do the test and they have a high levels of PSA to find out goes through biopsies, biopsies and stress and they find out later on they don't have prostate cancer. The other issue is that also this test is missing and some numbers kind of like 25% or 20s in the sense that uh, your, your levels of PSA are okay but somehow later on you find out that you have prostate cancer. So this is some issues of the PSA test. But again, like I was saying, when we look at the PSA, we have the protein, you have the sugars, and at the moment we are just measuring the protein side. But what we know now is that the sugars, when someone has prostate cancer, that sugar change. And uh, there is this, I don't want to complicate, but there is this protein and there's 56 different sugars attached. So this, this PSA appears in 56 different forms, but there's only four that are associated with aggressive prostate cancer. And is that four that we want to detect? And until recent years, we didn't have the technology to detect that type of sugars. And this is what developed in the group, a patent that has been granted now in Europe, in US, to detect exactly that sugars associate with aggressive prostate cancer. And this is what we can do, is to have a more accurate test to say to a man, you have aggressive prostate cancer and at early stage as well. So, so just to summarize then, I guess, PSA does an okay job, but it, it finds some men who haven't got cancer and tells them they might have, which is worrying and leads to other tests and it misses some cancers. And so your work is looking to try and, I guess, fix both of those issues, right? It's to come up with a more accurate test for prostate cancer. Exactly. So, so tell us a little bit about how the research is going. Where, where are you up to? Yeah, so everything started uh, when we, uh, we initiate this project. We have this, this technology to detect sugars, but it was using a very expensive equipment that we know will never go into the clinic. It was like 60,000 pounds just to kind of measure. So the research that we've been funded by Prostate Cancer UK is to translate that very expensive technology in a, a type of PSA test that will be offered to the men. That's when when we'll get there. So the the aim here is to have a a PSA type of test that will allow us to detect that sugars in uh, in a man in the blood test as as the PSA test. So it's not too different. But the research at the moment we have now the assay very similar to a PSA test, and we are about to get the blood samples from UCL because MP MRI is the best way to detect if someone has aggressive prostate cancer is above 90%. So we are validating this um, 
low cost type of assay with samples that will have been validated and we know what type of um, percentage will will have aggressive prostate cancer. So uh, we are at that stage now, very exciting that so two, three years just developing the technology, making it a very cheap assay. Now we can start to validate the, the assay. So hopefully in the next months or so, we'll have really exciting conclusions from the assay. That's great. So so I guess just to, to explain to the audience, so so basically your work up to now has been about developing the test, making sure it works and, and working on it in the lab. And now you're at the point where you're going to actually show it some samples from men with prostate cancer to see if it, if it really works in real life right exactly that is the exciting part of course for us it's also researching all these things but it's just a kind of it's been a long process and it's quite exciting now that we have a very strong assay to be able to be validated with clinical samples fantastic and so then so assuming that everything goes well with that next step what what happens after that how long you know what are the next steps and how long do you think before if if everything goes well this might be a new test for prostate cancer so we uh, we are working already with the University uh, of Birmingham Enterprise, and uh, we we know the we know how to get to the market. We have Roche Diagnostics as well involved in the project, and all is prepared the net to do a, a long clinical validation, a larger clinical validation, and then our aim is uh, hopefully in the next five to seven years to be able to bring it to the market because everything is in place for uh, as soon as we have the the validation. I think the way that it works, because it's so similar to a PSA test, will be very easy to translate to the clinic. Yeah, and, and I think that's a really exciting feature of your research that is that that practical applicability is, you know, it's it's not making something that you're going to need specialist equipment for. It's about making it as, as easy as possible. Um, I think there's an interesting point there about the the interaction and partnership with with big companies, and and you know, I think I guess we all understand why it's really important when you get to the later stages of research to have that company funding come in and, and help take it across the line. I think that probably links to, to John's research that we'll hear, hear about as well later, but um, maybe we can come back to that in questions. I suspect there'll be some questions about that. Um, so thank you for now, Paula. We'll, we'll bring you back in when we get to the Q&A. Um, I'm going to move across now. So, so we've heard from Alfred about understanding risk and going to the GP and, and getting a test. We heard from Paula about ways that we might, through research that we funded, improve the way we diagnose prostate cancer. And now I'm going to move over to, to, to talk to, to John, who's, who's a researcher uh, in Northern Ireland, about his research. And that focuses on how we treat prostate cancer. So once you're diagnosed, the other bit of our research strategy is making sure that men get the, the right treatment for them and that, that treatment has the best chance of, you know, stopping their prostate cancer from growing or curing it if possible. Um, but also does as little harm to them as possible. So all treatments have side effects, but but one of the really important things is to is to get the benefit and reduce the side effects, I guess. So with that, I don't want to steal John's John Sunder. I've got another poll before before I bring John in and get him to just introduce himself and, and talk about his research. Um, so the same question, but this time Northern Ireland rather than the Midlands. So you'll see that all the numbers are a bit bigger here. So I should I should probably say that. Um, there are a lot of prostate cancer researchers in Northern Ireland, and a lot of them are really good. Um, and so a few years ago, we, with Movember, we funded a, a prostate cancer research centre of excellence in Northern Ireland. And so we funded a lot of research in prostate cancer. So um, see if you can see if you can guess how much, whether it's 1.8, 2.4 or 2.8 million. I think this is in the, I think this is in the last five years again as well. Okay, so that poll has now disappeared. And so so this time you were smart to our trick and most people have gone for the highest amount and that is right. So we funded about just over 2.8 million pounds worth of research in Northern Ireland uh, in the past five years. Um, actually the amount before that was even more. So we've actually funded about 7 million pounds of research in prostate cancer in Northern Ireland since 1996. And I say a lot of that money went through that center of excellence. Um, so well done on getting the right answer. Um, and, and John, if I could just introduce you, I'll get, if I could ask you to introduce yourself and again, just tell us a little bit about your research, please. Sure. Uh, well, John Callan, I'm Professor of Pharmaceutical Science at Ulster University. 
in Northern Ireland for research focuses on trying to develop more effective ways that, uh, to deliver chemotherapy drugs and also develop new treatments that are more effective and, and uh, have less side effects than conventional uh, chemotherapy treatments. Excellent. So tell us, I guess, tell us a little bit, John, about chemotherapy generally. So, so how does it work? What does it do? And, and why do we need to improve on, on that as a treatment? Yeah, well, chemotherapy, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the term chemotherapy and, and has had, you know, family members or, or friends or, or loved ones that have, uh, you know, gone through a course of chemotherapy treatment. Chemotherapy is, is really a class of drugs that is designed um, to stop or slow down the growth of cancer cells. So by their very nature, they're, they're extremely toxic compounds. They're, they're cytotoxic. They're designed to kill cells. And the way that they, they work, unfortunately, means that uh, not only are cancer cells susceptible to their toxicity, but also normal healthy cells are also uh, susceptible to that toxicity to a certain extent. So when we're using chemotherapy as a treatment for cancers, trying to find a balance by which, uh, given a dose or a concentration of the drugs that will have an effect on the cancer cells, but not have too much of an effect on the healthy cells in the body to try and minimize the side effects to a certain extent. So our work is obviously focused on trying to uh, deliver these drugs in a, in, a, in a much more effective way um, to get more to where it's needed and less distributed elsewhere around the body so we can get more effective treatments with, with uh, minimal side effects. Excellent. So then the big question, I guess, the, the, the million dollar question is, how do you do it? How do you, how do you get the drug to where it needs to be and avoid hurting normal cells? Well, we utilize a, a technology known as uh, ultrasound targeted microbubble destruction. And I suppose that the simplest way to try and explain how this technology works is to, to sort of think of the, the bubbles that we would have blew as children from fairy liquid, for example, and then use the pressure of touch to burst those bubbles. So what we're trying to do is, is similar in many ways, but at a much, much reduced uh, scale. So the bubbles that we're using are micro bubbles, so they're micron size, are about 100 times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. And instead of using the pressure of touch to burst those bubbles, we're using the pressure of an ultrasound wave. So we load up our, our bubbles with chemotherapy and another treatment that also responds to ultrasound called sonodynamic therapy. So we load these bubbles up with uh, the, the drugs. We inject a suspension them into the, the systemic circulation. And then we use a focused ultrasound beam positioned at the tumor, the prostate tumor, to burst the bubbles, releasing the drugs and also activating the, the sonodynamic therapy component of the treatment. So it's a targeted drug delivery system with a combination of, of treatments working together. Uh, so it's low dose chemotherapy and sonodynamic therapy. So we're able to, to get much better effects than full strength chemotherapy at a fraction of the dose of toxic chemotherapy. So not only are the treatments more effective, they also are, are much, much better tolerated than a, than a full strength chemotherapy treatment. I suppose uh, I'm sure people will be fascinated by the idea of loading drugs into bubbles, but maybe we can come back to that, back to that in the questions. I, I guess I'm really interested to know because it's it sounds like such a sort of a wacky idea. Where where did where did it come from to start with that idea of using bubbles as the I guess as the sort of coating for the drug? Yeah, well, micro bubbles themselves are already used in medicine today. So we, before we started looking at them as a drug delivery vehicle. They were already approved for use as what are termed contrast agents in diagnostic ultrasound applications. So, for example, if you were done to get a, an examination of your liver by ultrasound or your heart, for example, quite often the, the doctor would, would give you an administration of these micro bubbles as, as a contrast agent to help improve that image that's given back. So, at the very, very low intensities, of diagnostic ultrasound, the bubbles just oscillate back and forth symmetrically, and that helps improve the, the echo that, that comes back uh, from the, the ultrasound. The, if you increase the pressure in the bubble, the ultrasound pressure, but still well within safe limits, you know, uh, safe, safe limits, then the bubbles will, will rupture. And it, it's, that, it, it's that concept that we have utilized in terms of targeting the, using the micro bubbles as a a targeted drug delivery vehicle. And we were also interested in stimuli responsive therapeutics. Um, so we, we looked at what's called sonodynamic therapy that uses ultrasound to activate a drug to make it go from being non-toxic to toxic. 
So we can use the same ultrasound stimulus that, that ruptures the bubbles to activate this component of the treatment as well. So it, it's it was sort of an evolution of, of uh, different components merging yeah. together to form this uh, final sort of treatment. Oh, that's absolutely fascinating. So, so where are you up to, John, with the with the research? What stage are you at? Well, we've just and we've been working on this for for many years, and our initial focus was in the area of pancreatic cancer. So, we probably are further down the road with with our uh, approach in pancreatic cancer, and we're planning to to start a clinical trial in that area quite soon. We've just recently finished the grant in prostate cancer, and um, that was funded by PCUK. So. As you mentioned in your opening, uh, Matt, there, there's generally a lag between you know the preclinical research finishing and you know being able to, to, to sort of jump into a clinical trial. But we're hopeful that the the work that was done in pancreatic cancer, as I say, there's a lot of commonalities in the technology. And I say one of the real attractive features of this technology is that the component parts, the micro bubbles, the ultrasound, the chemotherapies that we're using, they all have been used safely in humans before. So therefore, you know, we're putting them together in a different sort of way. So from a regulatory point of view, it's allowed us to have a, a sort of, you know, relatively smooth runway to the to the clinic. Um, and we've had several discussions with the regulator, the MHRA, on, you know, the, the sort of safety package, et cetera, that we will need. So hopefully in, in terms of a prostate cancer uh, clinical trial, we're, we're probably two to three years away from that realistically. Great. So yeah, again, like really nice to hear the you know the the progress towards clinic. I think is a really important message in that almost I guess taking it into clinic and taking it into clinical samples being the 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 first I guess the first exciting point and then getting it through those clinical trials is the next exciting point. Yeah. Um, I think we probably are uh, due to move on to questions. So so thank you, John, and again we'll. we'll bring you all back in as we start to get some Q and A's. I've, I've started to see the questions being asked. So. Um, we'll move on to that now, I think. Um, so bear with me while I look at my other screen and, and see which questions are being asked. So um, I guess I guess one for both John and Paula, I suppose, is, is there's a question about why research takes so long. So so I alluded to it uh, and uh, about the different steps we need to go through, but but maybe both of you could just touch on, you know, why does it take so long? And, and I guess what could we do as researchers or research funders to, to move it faster? Or is it just it has to take this long? Should I start, John? Yes, please do. Yeah. So we wish it was faster. It's always the kind of things that we aim at. But if we have, uh, we need to do so many developments. We have PhD students, we have postdocs in the group working at, at really good pace. But research will take time and things don't work at first. You know, we have this idea, we'll try, it doesn't work, and we need to think, what can we do to make it work? And all that process takes time, because it's, it's, it's a natural thing that not every idea that we have, we have the right idea, we know how to do things, but even to detect that sugars create these particles, we need the right size of the particles. We, we can start with 40 nanometers, but we want 10, now we get to that 10. So all that steps takes time. So it's building up an assay, in my case, it's building up an assay, and all of building that assay has challenged and all need to be tackled and this takes time, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and, uh, and, and in terms of, you know, testing new drug uh, or new drug formulations in humans as well, there's a, you know, there's a lot of regulatory barriers that you need to pass through. To, obviously, if we're going to give anything to a human being, we have to make sure that, first of all, that, that the technology is safe. That it's made effectively, that as Paula made it's, it's reproducible to make, that we can make it the same way every time. And you know, we have to submit this to the to the regulator and then get approval from them. And then as as, as Matt said as well, it's, it's not cheap to move to clinical trials. And you know, that there, there's the, the reason that the necessary funding to be able to, to fund that process, you know, through the after the development stage, so to show that it works in the lab, getting it then into uh, and the patients and as a commercial sort of uh, product it is also take is a is an expensive process as well as a time consuming process yeah so so i guess there's two things there's the there's the necessary trial and error to get to the right answer that that paula you talked about and then i suppose there's the making making absolutely sure that it that it whatever it is whether it's a test or a treatment actually works so we don't we don't do we don't cause harm so a lot of all that is 
that's why there are all those different stages and all those safety features in, in research. But yeah, I guess from a funding point of view, I would say that one of the things that holds back progress is still that we we can't fund research as quickly as it comes to us. And so you know, every time we run a funding competition, there, there is research that we'd like to fund that we can't. And so we, we, we do know that the more we raise, the, the quicker we can push, but within limits, I suppose. Um, John's a couple of questions for you specifically about your um, the micro bubbles and, and a question about whether it is this a treatment for localized prostate cancer or for metastatic prostate cancer and, and how does it work if it's metastatic? Yeah, good question. Um, it's it, it is a, a sort of targeted drug delivery system, so it's targeted specifically at, at the at the primary tumor. But we have evidence to show that the uh, the treatment, particularly the solidonomic therapy concept of the treatment will trigger an immune response that has the potential to treat metastatic disease as well. And that's a very exciting aspect of the work. And we've shown that that combines very well with uh, emerging immuno uh, checkpoint inhibitor, uh, immuno, immunotherapies, particularly the immune checkpoint inhibitor type drugs. So although it is a, a, you know, a targeted treatment to deliver you know, the treatment specifically to the, to the, the primary tumor, um, it, it does have potential to treat uh, metastatic disease through this immune stimulation. Okay, so just, so, so just I guess for the audience that so there's a there's a real I guess explosion of excitement about a, a new a new way of treating cancer called immunotherapy, which which instead of treating the cancer directly, encourages your own immune system to try and get rid of the cancer instead. And there's there's various different ways that that's being done. It's been really successful in some cancers, so uh, lung cancer and skin cancer especially. Now we're seeing people with those cancers with very advanced cases of those cancers cured by immunotherapy it hasn't worked yet in prostate cancer there's something odd about prostate cancer and a couple of other cancers actually that that seems to prevent those treatments that that manipulate the immune system from working but other stuff like like john's microbials and different ways of, of manipulating that immune system are starting to look promising and so it's a really really interesting area of research um i wonder if i could ask you so i, I kind of talked a little bit about the interaction with industry and and how that looks and why it's important and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing and try not to be leading but um maybe i can maybe i can hand over to to paula to talk about that that relationship with roche i think you mentioned yeah so uh, they've been involved since the beginning because the assay that we are developing we still need the an antibody to capture the PSA in a particular way that the sugars are attached, uh, are uh, exposed at the interface. And this antibody only is uh, is not commercially available, is from Roche. And from the beginning, is providing, kindly providing that antibody. And apart from that, is, we are getting guidance from them how we should develop the assay as well. We have meetings with them in terms of development. So that they are quite engaged and as soon as we have this clinical validation they will be on board to uh, to explore further and this is what we need because we don't want to start a startup or anything we want to uh, work with these uh, companies that have their own PSA test and it will be just a replacement from the PSA test, PSA test for our own test that is a better version of what is out there at the moment yeah that's, that's really helpful and, and John for yours I guess there's is there any commercial interest yet, or are you, are you still in an early stage where, where that's not yet relevant? Yeah, well, as, as I mentioned earlier, with, with reference to the pancreatic cancer, um, there has been a company uh, formed to try and progress the tech and that technology first through a first in human clinical trial. Uh, a company is called Sonotarg Limited. So that's really it, it's a it's a spin out company from the university. As I say, it's it's difficult to recruit or get the funding necessary to. You know, detect these technologies from very promising, exciting preclinical research that's funded by the charities to a commercial platform. And, and you know, it's difficult in the therapeutic area to, to get, tra get traction early on with big pharma until you actually have some human, you know, data in humans. So, so uh, that company, Sonotarg, has been founded to uh, to bring the, the technology of pancreatic cancer into the first in human clinical trial. And as I say, that will certainly smoothen the path for uh, you know a potential trial in prostate cancer too if the pancreatic cancer trial is, is uh, successful that's really helpful. i mean and, and certainly from from our point of view as a funder we welcome that engagement we welcome our researchers engaging with commercial like with companies because 
we know that eventually research gets to a stage where it needs such a big trial that we can't fund it. So, so for example, so the last stage clinical trial, phase three clinical trials, especially for treatments which prove that a treatment works and gets it into clinic, they tend to cost hundreds of millions of pounds. And so there's, there's no way the charity can fund those. So by that point, we need a company to come in and fund those, those really big clinical trials. Um, and, and so actually we, we also spend a lot of time talking to companies and trying to make them excited about prostate cancer and excited about what's coming through so that we can reduce that delay, I guess. Um, there's a question about teamwork and it, it, it's mainly about teamwork in terms of research teams. So, so you two aren't delivering all of this on your own, but actually I'm, I'm interested in, in, the, in the clinical situation as well, Alfred, about, you know, as you went through your diagnosis and your treatment, I guess you met different clinicians and you, you presumably had the options explained about radiotherapy or surgery or active stem. So did you meet a range of, of different people in that clinical team or was yours a, a straightforward straight to the surgery? And Sorry, Alfred. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, gotcha. When, when I was told that I got prostate cancer, when I had to go back to the hospital after my biopsy, Basically, my options was radical prostatectomy or brachytherapy at the time. But you put in these questions to someone who hasn't got a clue about prostate cancer. And that's what they do. They put you in the position and says, we can do A or B when you've got no idea what so that's A the B is. That's, that's the GP who was having that conversation? No, that was the... at the hospital. Right, okay. I was diagnosed up at the hospital. They just basically said... This is a lucky for me when I did get diagnosed, I was with my daughter and because that she does work at an hospital and she was aware of certain things. I was going to have brachytherapy because it sounds simple. Yeah, it was, there wasn't going to cut me open. So it sounds simple. But then when I thought about it, I ended up thinking most doctors would think if you've got a cancer in your body, you want it gone. So I went for a radical prostatectomy. I had it removed completely. Yeah, it's, it's a, and we, so we hear that from men at the point of diagnosis really, really frequently of that, you know, we're, we're asked to make a choice of Something you don't know about. three or four treatments with incomplete information. And, and actually it's very difficult. And we hear it from doctors as well, actually, it's the, the treatments are all pretty good. And so it's quite difficult to say you should definitely go for that one. It's, it is about that side effect profile and each man's a bit different in what they value. And so uh, I think a link has gone back into the specialist nurses that is an area of particular expertise for the nurses explaining all of those treatment options so that hopefully everybody can can make that right decision for them like it sounds like you made after it so but it was a difficult decision for me because at the time i didn't know what to do because regardless both of them had side effects yeah. i think i might be lucky i justified to myself because i was only 50 at the time when i was fit and healthy i've got through it okay but it was yeah. one of the hardest decisions of my life, working out what to do. Yeah, yeah, it is a, it's almost an impossible decision because you, you can't know until it's, you yeah. know, until you've made it. Um, that's great. And so John and Paula, just on the sort of teamwork bit, you, big teams, small teams who, who collaborate, yes. how does that all work in research? Yeah, so we, uh, we have um, a postdoc funded by Prostate Cancer UK, but uh, I also have uh, an, a PhD student funded by the School of Chemical Engineering, University of Birmingham, one from Botswana scholarship and another one from um, Azerbaijan. So it's a kind of a big team, although we are funded partially by Prostate Cancer UK, we have a team of, um, of four people working really to push as much as we can uh, while writing their, doing their PhD and writing their thesis, they, they work together. And, and this is a fantastic thing because when we have these subgroups, I have a group of 14 people, but when we have these groups working on that particular case, we do a lot of brainstorming. And this is the best part. It's just the kind of coming together as a group and be able to, uh, to tackle. And it's dividing the, the, the tasks. We know where we want to go. And this person is doing this, the other person is doing that. And then we come together, all of us discuss the advance. And if more energy, more time, effort needs to be put on a particular area of the research, people will be dragged in that direction. So this is what teamwork really allows us to do. Excellent, thank you. So, and we've got another question, which is a, a hot topic in research and outside research as well, I think. So somebody's asked for, for John and Paula, 
what impact do you think AI is going to have on prostate cancer? I haven't really given much thought, to be honest. I, I, I think the, the when it will come to this type of test and values, and I, I, I don't think it's just the this PS the 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 amount of sugars that we have or in PSA that will be, but it will be a kind of a combination of different. And one thing that I believe at a certain point you will not have these in vitro tests. We might have in vivo tests where we're collecting certain amount of data and AI will be quite useful in terms of monitoring and all this data and understand when someone goes from a healthy state to uh, to a disease state. So AI, I'm sure will have a big play in all I this diagnostic think, area. I think you're right. I think I think the primarily it will be about how we diagnose prostate cancer. It, you know, there's so much that we don't understand that the machine can see without even needing to understand it. I think that's where we're going to start to see it. I do think in the end we'll end up using AI to try and work out or to give us an answer on, I guess, kind of what you were talking about, Alfred, a little bit. Rather than just making men guess which treatment's right for them, can we use AI to to actually look at their scans, their biopsies, their blood tests, and say actually there's something here that tells us that this man will be better with surgery or bracket therapy. Um, so I think it's coming. It's coming quick, but we need to make sure that it's done right. So again, talking about safety. We need to make sure that any of those AI tools, the way they're developed is based on samples that are collected now. And we need to make sure that the samples that they're trained on, they're developed on, one, are right, and two, are representative. Um, so there's no point just throwing a load of very treatable cancer at an AI tool and saying, learn how to treat this, because we already know how to treat that. It's, it's, the, it's the difficult cases we needed to help with. Um, the very specific question, Paula, for you about um, detecting PSA and sugars, does it have to be in blood or could it be in urine? It, so uh, the reason why you are doing blood, because there is an area that is glycoproteomics and glycoproteomics means that uh, there's other research before us because we are just, know, we know that for sugars in PSA, but who is telling us is the glycoproteomics and what has been going on is the glycoproteomics were done in blood, not in urine. And there is some work done in urine, and urine has less amount of everything. So uh, if we're looking for PSA and particular forms of PSA, we'll have a higher amount, and so a diagnostic test will be easier to be done in that sense than when we have a urine test. Okay, so yeah, so so it's it, you might see them in urine, but you probably won't get the strongest signal, right? So it's, it's going to be harder. Exactly. Right. Helpful. Thank you. Um, there's one which I think is probably for me about um, how do we make sure or who monitors what research is being funded across the world to make sure that we're not funding the same thing as somebody else. Um, so I, I touched on it a little bit at the start, but basically the way, so there's two ways that we make sure that we're not funding research that's being done elsewhere. So the first way is I spend a lot of time talking to other funders across the world and funders that aren't in prostate cancer. So I talk to pharmaceutical companies to understand what they're doing. I talk to Prostate Cancer Foundation, who are a big funder of prostate cancer in the US, to understand, I guess, priorities and, and make sure that we're all working it to, to deliver real impact, but without stepping on each other's toes, I suppose. Um, but actually, the, the real way we do it is through that assessment process. So when we get a research proposal in, we send it out. So it's a 100 page or more document um, where the researchers tell us everything about what they want to do and how much it will cost. We then send those, each, every single one of those gets sent out to at least three expert independent reviewers around the world who work in that particular area. So, for example, when Paula's um, application came in, we'd have sent that to people working in diagnosis, we'll have sent it to people working in glycoproteins and sugars. When John's came in, we'd have, we'd have sent that to people working in targeted therapy and probably some people who'd work with microbubbles. Each of those, each of those independent researchers, we ask to tell us if it's good. Is this a good proposal? Is it going to make a difference for men? Is the science sound? But we specifically ask them, is this novel? So is anybody else doing this? Because if it isn't, if if somebody else is already doing it and doing exactly the same thing, then we won't fund it. So so it's a key part of our of our um, assessment process, I guess. We then. We then ask the same question to our funding committee, who is that group that we pull of, of senior researchers in prostate cancer from around the world. And again, we very deliberately, and not all funders do this, but we very deliberately have people from outside the UK on that committee. 
so that they can tell us what's happening in Europe, in the States, in Canada. Um, and and we, so we're very, very careful. And we ask that question a lot because the person who asked the question is exactly right. We want to fund stuff that, that moves things forward. We don't just want to fund something that's happening already. Um, so there's a, there's a question about um, risk in other ethnic groups. So we talked about the double the, the risk in black men. Um, there, is, there is different risk in different other different ethnicities. So, so um, Asian men have a lower risk than, than white men of prostate cancer. Again, we don't understand why the, why the chance of getting prostate cancer is higher or lower in different ethnicities. And so that's a really important ongoing area of research. It's definitely something to do with genetics. But genetics is really, really complex. So there are around about 250 different genes that slightly increase or slightly reduce your risk of getting prostate cancer. And so there'll be something in that that is different between ethnicities, but it's not, it's not going to be a simple answer. There's going to be a lot of stuff that we need to understand about it. Um, really good question for, for Alfred. Alfred, so one of the things that's really important to Prostate Cancer UK is making sure that we are getting that awareness message in front of the men who are at highest risk. And so obviously that means black men. Do you have any ideas as a black man, as a black man with prostate cancer on how we can how we can do that and how our support groups and our volunteers can do that? Try to recruit recruit more volunteers. Because at the moment, if I knew someone and they wanted to become a volunteer, they wouldn't even know how to go about it. Yeah. It was a struggle when I became a volunteer 10 years ago. I had to go on the internet. You had like a training day in Birmingham. Well, that was 10 years ago. Now, if someone said to me how to be a volunteer, I wouldn't even know how to guide them to the right direction. Because if you've got the volunteers out there directly speaking to people, that makes a difference, especially if the person speaking to them looks like them. People can relate to people what look like them, look the same age group as them. You know what I mean? Then they'll open up and you can have this conversation and then convince them to take the next step. That's, I think that's really helpful and, and good advice for the charity. I think, you know, make sure that we've got a range, a diverse range of volunteers and that we make it easy for them to, to do the job they want to do and the job we want them to do, which is raise awareness. Yeah. Um, let me see what else we've got. Oh, there's a, there's a really nice question here about um, how how patients can get involved in research. So uh, we talked a little bit about clinical trials and, and being recruited into clinical trials, but what um, John and Paul, I guess, your, your research is slightly early stage. Do you involve patients in it? And, and what do you think is best practice in that space? Yeah, we do. Um, I think we do quite a bit of, uh not only you know on our research side but also through our, our academic teaching side as well in terms of you know patient and public involvement with our and, and bringing students in to speak to or bringing patients in to speak to our students as, as well um but it's important to you know to engage with with patients and they identify you know ultimately where we're going to position our treatment you know where is the best place to position this treatment as Alfred says, you know, in prostate cancer, there's there's several different types of treatment, and um, you know, there, there's different experiences with those those treatments as well. There's different side effects, etc. So, I think it's important to, to listen to patients, to identify what their experiences are, and you know how that could potentially help us, you know, identify the best way to deliver our treatment. So, for so so basically, your you're engaging with patients to try and understand that long term where you place the treatment, like what 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 the what the need really is. Yeah, where is the need exactly, and and you know how can it improve on the current standard of care? You know, for example, you know obviously from a from a chemotherapy point of view, and prostate cancer chemotherapy is used quite late on in the treatment pathway. Um, but you know what are the experiences of that? Is there any way that we can could potentially use that earlier on that may prevent the progression of symptoms, for example, another, you know, another because we're we're delivering very low doses of chemotherapy, could we use it earlier in the treatment pathway? Um, so yeah, it, it's there's various different aspects that can be can allow us to better inform our research um, by engaging with with patients early on. That's that's really good to hear, John. So so as a funder, we do a couple of things in it on on that. So we think it's really important that 
that men with prostate cancer, all the families of men who die from prostate cancer are involved in informing research. And so for us, part of our assessment process, you know, we've talked about the, the research experts telling us whether research is good or not. But we also have a panel of people with lived experience who, who we ask, is it important? Would you get involved in this trial if you were asked to be, you know, if you were asked to be involved in it? So we, we get that patient input into our decision making. We also have a, a bigger group of patients who are, are happy to get in touch with the researchers um, to help them do exactly what you said, John, so to, to develop their ideas, to work out the real need, to understand it from a patient's point of view. Um, and and that, so we do a sort of matchmaking service on that. Um, so I think whoever asked that question is, it is a very important one of, of involving patients in research. Um, there's a question about uh, a little bit surprised they're talking to them now to come up um, about screening for prostate cancer and why we don't have screening for prostate cancer. And um, so it is a very, very appropriate question because actually one of the things we see is that being diagnosed in time early enough when your prostate cancer is still localized in your prostate. As I think Alfred said it a couple of times, he was lucky to have a GP who raised it. He was, he was lucky to have caught it early. And the only way we can make it not look is to get a screening program for prostate cancer. So a screening program will be like in breast cancer where you'd get a letter every so many years saying, coming to you to say, go and get your PSA test or your, your prostate screening. The reason we don't have it is because the evidence isn't good enough. That is really the, the real reason for it. And what that means in practice is, so you heard Paula mention that some of those downsides of the PSA test were it, it sends men for additional tests they don't need because they haven't got cancer and it misses some cancers. All of the evidence we've got about screening for prostate cancer with PSA was done before men got an MRI as part of the pathway. So I think from what you said, Alfred, you didn't have a, an MRI scan as part of your diagnosis. Is that right? Only after, after the biopsy. Okay. Yeah, so, so after the biopsy, because I had pains in my back at the time, nothing to do with this. They just wanted to make sure. So I had a CT scan and a biopsy, but that was after I was diagnosed anyway. Yeah, so so now what's ha what's changed since when Alfred was diagnosed to now is that now that MRI is done for men who've got a raised PSA, but before they have a biopsy. And, what it's, and it's based on research that we funded actually a long time ago. Um, what it's done is it's reduced it's reduced the amount of harm that's done by having a PSA test because far fewer men now have a PSA test, don't have cancer, but have a biopsy. And, and if you don't need a biopsy, you want to avoid it. Um, so it has changed what happens in practice. It might be that it's changed things enough that we now have a good enough diagnostic pathway to screen for prostate cancer. But the people who make that decision, the National Screening Committee, want they need trial evidence that shows them that we don't do too much harm and we still do all of the benefit that we think we do by screening and that so so the short answer is we need they need research to convince them of that it's difficult to design and fund that research but we are going to do it because it is such an important thing to do the other thing to say is that pathway has changed already but, but we're also seeing other ways to diagnose prostate cancer that look like they do a better job than psa so so i think paula's test will be in this category in the next few years but we do have things like using MRI scans right up front that that are that are better than PSA. But again, to, to get that into a screening program, we need to absolutely prove that it does find men with prostate cancer, with, with high risk prostate cancer, at a point where they can be cured. And it does it does improve life expectancy, it does stop men dying. Again, we need to fund the research to do that. And and we realize this is a little bit of a cop-out answer to end on. We are going to fund that research. We've got, we had a targeted funding call a couple of years ago and we will fund that research. We're just at the point of working out exactly what that research needs to do and how it needs to be delivered. But we are going to do it. It will take some time to get there though. And that's why it's really important that we continue to raise awareness, that we continue to do the stuff around the risk check at all, that we continue to get people like Alfred talking about prostate cancer and telling men that they're at risk. Um, because it will take us some time to deliver that research that, that gets us to screening. And so for now, we just, we, we really need to focus on raising awareness. Um, there's a very quick one for me that I'll finish on and then I'll, I'll close up. Um, do we only fund research in the UK? So Prostate Cancer UK does only fund research in the UK. 
some of the research that we fund has international collaborators so the, the research we fund will be working with teams in in other countries but our money goes to the researchers in the uk so yes that, yes um, i think we're rapidly running out of time um and so i should probably close up so so i'd like to to first of all to close up say thank you to to alfred paula and john really appreciate you taking the time to to tell us about your research or tell us about your personal experience alfred and and to to give our audience a bit of an insight into into what what either of those things has been like for you so thank you thank you all very very much um i'd also like to take the opportunity to thank everybody in the audience so there's about 300 of you in the audience you're all people who have engaged with prostate cancer uk and supported us in some way a lot of you will have done that by donating money and um, that money is absolutely essential we can't fund any research without the money that that you donate or that you fundraise for us so thank you to everybody who's donated money to us or raised money for us um thank you also some of the people in the audience will have will have supported us with time and with awareness raising like alfred does that's also absolutely essential to what we're trying to do to, to reduce the number of men dying from prostate cancer so thanks to all of you um just another shout out for uh, the risk checker tool so if anybody has relatives or has or doesn't know about their own risk uh, there's another link in the in the chat to the risk checker tool i really would encourage you to to look at that tool it's it's i had no part in designing or developing that and so i'm not boasting but it is an excellent tool it's won awards because it's a really simple way to to explain what is quite a complex thing to to learn about um we've got a couple of feedback polls coming so um when we open them we'd, we'd really appreciate you filling these in just so that we understand a little bit about the audience and a little bit about whether you enjoyed this um and if you did enjoy it that's great but what you particularly enjoyed so we can do it again if you didn't enjoy it that's also really important for us to know so that we can make sure that the next the next one of these that we do uh, does meet the, the the things that you want it to meet um i wouldn't really be doing my job i talked about how um how important the money that all of you have donated in the past is in helping us fund research talked about that early diagnosis research that we need to fund the, the research that will get us the screening we've got an appeal out at the minute asking for asking for funding specifically to fund research uh, related to early diagnosis and so uh, there's also a link in the chat to to that appeal and recognize that this is not an easy time to be to be sparing cash for for anything um, but if anybody has has got the means and the inclination to donate we, we would really appreciate it um and it, it will make an impact i hope i've shown you that or we've given you the links to see that the research we fund does make an impact and you can see that, that we're doing things properly we're funding good research and it's making an impact and not only through that through that funding so um thank you to all of you for for joining us this evening um i think i need to just slow down because i think there's a second feedback poll yeah there's the second feedback poll um i think there were there were quite a lot of questions that we didn't get to answer in out loud um i think there's probably a link in the chat to, for people to send questions to um i can't see the chat anymore so i hope that's true um but we will we will try and answer as many of them um by email as well as we as we carry on um so i'm waiting for a nod to say that we've got the feedback poll the feedback from the second poll that we need um i think it's just closed so i think we have so so on that note i will say again thank you everybody for joining us thank you to the panelists especially for, for giving up your time and and giving us an insight um and hopefully have a nice evening everybody and, and speak soon